Isn't that funny? Hmm. We'll get started here in just a second. Oh, Ken Bradstreet, you may be sharing and you probably don't want to be sharing. So if you can unshare, that would be great. Thank you. There you go. All right, it's 10 o'clock on the nose, so I think we'll go ahead and get started um, because I want to um, make sure we take make good use of our time. We've got a pretty full agenda today, so thanks everybody for joining. I'm, I've stopped counting. We're on our September meeting of the UP Energy Task Force. Um, what I do know is that it's a lot of extra time for everybody that's serving on the task and so I just want to say how much we really appreciate your effort and your participation in this. It has been, um, I think, a little bit. It's been funny that we haven't been together since July. I've missed seeing all of you, even virtually. So um, I'm glad we're back together, and I am excited about our agenda today. Um, so uh, sorry, I should start off. Um, I'm Lisa Clark. I'm the director of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and this is our September meeting for the UP Energy Task Force. Uh, so for those of you that aren't on the task force, I hope you're in the right place. We're glad to have you. Um, just as a setting for ground rules, task force members will be asking questions and having dialogue uh, throughout this meeting. And then at the end, we will have time for public comment. So if you're interested in giving us public comment, we love to receive it. Either you can have some time on this meeting. You can have three minutes at the end of the meeting. Um, we also always appreciate emails and other types of materials. Um, if you are just joining us, you can look at our website, michigan.gov uh, slash UP Energy Task Force um, to get uh, all of our previous work. So go check that out if you haven't seen that already. Recordings, presentations, task force members, all that kind of stuff. OK, those are the those are the ground rules. Um, so first of all, we're going to go ahead and just do a roll call of members. As I mentioned, we've got a few folks that I think weren't able to join, but I want to make sure we've checked everybody that is able to join. Um, and just as a reminder, if you could please mute if you're not talking, that always makes life a little bit better. Um, so please do mute. All right, I'm going to start off with um, my good vice chair, Mr. Prusi, Senator Prusi, um, the first of the mics. Are you with us, Mike? All right, we do not have Prusi yet. Uh, Tanya Pazlowski. I'm on. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Tanya. All right. Uh, and Chris Bowman let me know that he was un unable to join us. I think I saw Dave Camps. His picture keeps moving around here on my screen. Dave, are you with us? I am. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Morning, Dave. All right. Um, the second of the mics, Mike Fermanski. I saw him a minute ago. There he is. He popped yep. up again. Yeah, I'm here. Morning, Lazel. Good morning, Mike. Um, all right. Uh, Jen Hill, are you with us? Jen Hill, if you can't get off mute, are you with us this morning? All right, we'll check back in case she joins us later. Uh, Douglas, I see you right on my front screen. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, and then um, Aaron Johnson. Aaron, I think I see you here too. Good yeah. morning, director. Good morning, Aaron. Uh, Mr. Kajibu <coughs> wasn't able to join us. Jim's not here. Uh, Michael Larson. Here. Howdy. Great. Good morning, Michael. Um, Mike Nystrom. Good morning, everyone. I'm on the phone today. Good morning, Mike. Uh, Tony, and you've been on my screen right there. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. Good morning, Director, and all others on the conference call. Take care. Great. Um, General Rogers. All right. He called me this morning. I suspect to let me know that he got pulled into something else. Um, we've been trading. Uh, Chairman Scripps. Good morning, Director. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Roman, I see you. You've got some sweet headphones, sir. <laughs> They're Michigan Tech provided headphones. Um, they are the indeed sweet. <laughs> yep. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Chris Schwartz. Chris, are you with us this morning? President Schwartz. All right, we do not have Chris. And Tanya Sweener, nice to see you. I'm here. Great, good morning. 
All right, that is all of us for now. Did I miss any task force members who are on that maybe weren't able to unmute in time to say hello? Jen uh, Hill is here. On the line. Oh, I hear Jen Hill, and then did I hear Senator Prusi? Yes, you did. The dulcet to to tones of Mike Prusi's voice. I can even just tell it over the over the interwebs. Great. Okay, glad to have you both. Wonderful. Okay, so we've not met since July. We're so glad to be together again and have a good agenda for today. Um, just remember when we talked in July, one of the things we mentioned is that if we're in this um, fun virtual world, um, we agreed that it probably made sense to do more meetings, but for a briefer amount of time. So we're going to try to continue to keep to that um, format. And we do have um, an agenda for all of you that Kimber sent out a couple of days ago. Um, I'm sorry, you received an agenda, but then you also received a list of dates so that we can um, get some more dates on the calendar. Uh, so please uh, know that that's there and we'll uh, formally adopt that in a little bit. Um, also wanted to mention that um, you received an email from Karen, um, from Aaron Johnson um, from MDOT talking about recommendation five um, from our report and asking for uh, input from task force members. So please take a look at that and see if you have input uh, to give Aaron on that RFP um, around state planning and research for railroad companies. Um, excuse me, so if we've got feedback on that, that would be great. Also wanted to mention that uh, Jim Lively from Groundworks reached out and he is doing a UP energy meeting um, in uh, November. And I believe he has coordinated with some of you already. He said it's a UP clean energy conference. Um, they're interested in also interacting with the task force. I think we have a task force meeting um, just a couple of days before um, when that meeting will be happening. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm open to thoughts about how to uh, participate. I think in my mind it's similar to how we were hoping to coordinate with the UP Energy Conference uh, last May that ended up unfortunately not happening um, due to COVID. So I'm assuming we can do some sort of interaction like that. It sounds like some of you might already be participating. Um, curious uh, just if anybody has comments on that or additional input for the task force members. Madam Chair, I have a question, Tony Rutaski. Sure. Hi, Tony. If a number of us join that meeting, are we considered a quorum or is there something that we can do? I mean, I know that a lot of us could be together at a meeting and it, it could be something, it could be a funeral for that matter. But what I'm what I'm asking is, do we have to post anything if there's a quorum listed attending that meeting? Yeah, that's a good question, Tony. I don't know the answer. I'll have a conversation with my Open Meetings Act folks about um, to what extent that would impact. Thank you. Uh, this group. Yeah, thanks for flagging. Um, and this is Jen Hill. I, I think we're the agenda is still under development, so it's open uh, to getting in. Right now it's really broad. There's a um, several different projects that are going to be highlighted in addition to the task force. And it's just a way to bring people together to talk about the energy. I think it's simply a way to try to get people together. Like, as you said, since we didn't have an event this spring, so we're open to suggestion. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, John. We'll figure out a way to interact. Maybe it's somebody just doing an update from the task force too. All right, um, let's see. Then I think it probably makes sense for us to go ahead and discuss and adopt our agenda. Uh, so you received an agenda on September 8th for our meeting today. Um, just as a brief overview, we're gonna have a presentation from Aaron Wallen from Cloverland. And then we've got a uh, uh, overview of UP Energy from Douglas Jester at Five Lakes, task force member. Um, we've got some open time for discussion, but of course we can coordinate that into Q&A um, with the presenters as well, and then we will take public comments at the end of the meeting today. So do I have a motion to adopt this agenda? Rutaski, so moved. Thanks, Tony. Second? Second. Second. Great. So it's in front of us. Any discussion on today's agenda? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 
Any opposition? Uh, All right, the agenda is in front of us. Uh, or is, is adopted. So next, let's um, approve the meeting schedule. So uh, you received this on September 8th, um, or excuse me, September 11th. So the upcoming dates are today, October 7th, November 6th, and December 15th. And again, um, we'll stick to that attempted format to keep our meetings uh, briefer, but with this more frequency. Um, so, um, do I have a motion to put the calendar in front of us? Douglas Chester. Thank you. Second. Roman. David Camp. Okay. Any discussion on those dates? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Great, so we've adopted our new meeting schedule. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think the last thing we need to do before we get into presenters is approve our July 15th meeting minutes. Uh, so fo hopefully folks have had a chance to look at that. Thank you, uh, Tanya Pazlowski, for continuing to serve in the secretary role for us. Um, her edits have been incorporated. Um, so let's go ahead and adopt, uh, get those in front of us and see if there's any discussion. Um, so can I have a motion to put the minutes from the July meeting in front of us? So moved. This is Dan Scripps. Dan. Second. Douglas Chester. Thank you, Douglas. Um, any discussion on the July 15th minute meeting minutes? Tanya, does your guest have any comments? <laughs> <laughs> no, he just is always by me. <laughs> He's beautiful. OK, uh, I'm going to take this <laughs> opportunity to also say how much I appreciate Kimber's great work keeping us organized here. She makes life so wonderful um, and you know, keeping the minute meeting minutes moving is just one small example of it. So it just seems like a good time to remember that. Um, all right, uh, all in favor of the July 15th meeting minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposition? Meow. OK. <laughs> Thanks all. All right, with that, we're into the meat of our meeting. So first, I'd like to uh, invite. I, let me just say, too, I forgot to remind everybody we are, of course, recorded and these will all be posted on the website. All the previous ones are posted on the website as well. Um, all right, with that, I'm excited to invite Aaron Wallen up. He is the CFO, Director of Power Marketing and Regulatory Affairs for Cloverland. We're very excited to hear your presentation, Aaron. Take it away. All right, thank you, Madam Chair and Task Force members for the opportunity uh, to provide the Cloverland perspective today. Uh, let me just get this started here. All right, can you see the presentation? Not yet. Yeah. Yet. Not yet. OK, let's see here. We will share it a different way. All right, how about now? It's great. All right. Uh, so we are Clover. I'm sorry, can I ask you quickly? Do you like questions in the middle or do you like questions at the end? Uh, we can ask questions however you would like throughout or at the end, uh, whatever your preference. Okay. Uh, Thanks, happy sir. to answer anytime. Uh, so this is Cloverland Electric Cooperative uh, presentation today uh, before the uh, Eagle Task Force, uh, UP Energy um, Task Force, I guess, uh, looking at uh, now energy across the uh, UP. Um, so just a little bit about uh, co-ops uh, in general. It's a, we take up and, and serve a pretty large area uh, within the United States. Uh, as you can see here, there's about just under 900 uh, total cooperatives within the United States. A majority of those are electric distribution cooperatives. There are some uh, GNTs, uh, normally typically like one per state, say like a Wolverine. Um, there's about 20 million American homes, uh, farms and businesses served by electric cooperatives. We're located across the United States, only two states uh, without cooperatives uh, within them uh, serving electric customers. Um, 
just under or 42 percent of the distribution lines within the United States are owned by electric cooperatives. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the ownership uh, and the cooperative structure here in a little bit. Um, one important thing to note uh, that makes us different uh, from investor owned utilities and even uh, even maybe some munis, uh, we are nonprofit and we're exempt from state and uh, and federal income taxes. Uh, we do pay uh, property taxes uh, within the state, but uh, that is, uh, since we are a nonprofit, uh, all of the uh, profit, or we call them margin uh, at cooperatives, that all goes back to the members. Uh, that is allocated back to the members in many different ways. Typically, uh, at least for Cloverland, it's based on the amount of uh, energy usage during that particular year. Uh, then Michigan Electric Cooperative. So I have eight listed here. Uh, Cloverland is, well, will separate out, uh, but we're one of nine cooperatives in the state of Michigan. Uh, so that represents about 1% of the total cooperatives uh, within the United States. Uh, you can see the largest here as far as uh, land mass and also number of members uh, is Great Lakes Energy. Uh, they're listed as number three and nine on the map here. Uh, and then there are three uh, Michigan co-ops located across the UP, uh, Cloverland uh, being the largest. Uh, we, uh, as we'll see in the in the next slide here, um, we serve a majority of the eastern uh, UP. So here's the map. Uh, everything in green then uh, shows Cloverland Electric Cooperative. We extend all the way from Delta County uh, in the west to Chippewa County and Drummond Island in the east. Uh, we do serve Mackinac Island as well. Um, and as we'll see later on, we do serve uh, a significant number of islands uh, throughout uh, in Lake Huron and the, um, not, not in Lake Michigan, but uh, in the Lake Huron area, including Mackinac Island, Nebish Island, Sugar Island, which is the largest. So um, it, we, we were founded in 1938. Uh, so that was uh, around the time of the New Deal. Uh, rural electrification was uh, an opportunity and, and seen as a way to uh, move the rural areas of the United States forward. Um, having elect electricity um, allowed many more things on, on farms and in rural communities uh, for things to develop. So um, we're very small at that point in time, only about a thousand members. Um, so contrast that with the now we have uh, thir over 33,000 members, 43,000 meters. Um, in 2010, Cloverland acquired an investor owned utility that was owned by We Energies in Wisconsin called Edison Sioux Electric. That effectively more than doubled the size of Cloverland Electric Cooperative to make it what it is today. Uh, so we serve over 4,000 miles of distribution line. Again, over a five county service territory uh, here within the eastern part of the UP. We are member regulated. So uh, what that means is that uh, as far as what's most important, I guess, for for members is rates. Um, we, our board, um, makes their own determination as to what the rates should be uh, that our members pay for different uh, rate classes or tariffs. Um, for those members within our service territory, so we don't have to file a rate case um, in Michigan um, with the MPSC. Uh, we do still file a number of um, documents or reports uh, to the MPSC. Um, we are in, in monthly uh, communications, if not more often with the MPSC on a number of things that we have going on in the cooperative. So while we're not regulated from a rate standpoint, from a, a service quality standpoint and a number of other um, issues and areas, um, we are in, in communication with the MPSC. Um, one of the differences, um, from Cloverland's perspective, I guess, is we're not associated with a GNT or a joint action agency. So that's that's slightly different um, than a majority of the other co-ops um, within uh, Michigan. So um, um, I'm sorry, Ontonagan uh, over on the west, they're associated and take power under a contract from uh, Wolverine, I believe, and they're switching over to that um, in transition, I think, from We Energies uh, over to Wolverine. Um, you have um, Alger Delta that's associated with uh, WIPI. Um, I believe all of the lower Michigan, pen, uh, lower peninsula uh, co-ops are associated with Wolverine um, and have long-term uh, power supply arrangements with Wolverine uh, with the exception of Thumb. Uh, so that is, uh, is one exception there. I believe they have uh, long-term agreements with, uh, with others. 
Um, we are a MISO market participant, and so you've heard that from uh, a couple of the other presenters here, UPCO, um, as well as uh, Marquette and Escanaba, that they are market participants as well. Um, but from a co-op perspective, um, I believe we're unique. I think we are the only uh, market participant, uh, MISO market participant, um, from a co-op perspective within the state of Michigan. Uh, we are also an owner um, of ATC and a customer. Uh, so when uh, transmission assets were transferred to ATC, uh, Cloverland at that time uh, transferred its assets over to ATC and became a member, albeit small, I believe we're about 0.6% uh, ownership or have about 0.6% ownership um, with ATC. Um, and as we'll talk about a little bit later on, uh, we do have a, a pretty significant portion of hydroelectric um, generation uh, within our service territory. And so um, we're very proud of that fact and, and we'll see how that impacts Cloverland here in a little bit. Um, Aaron, this is Douglas Jester. Just a suggestion that you take a moment and define GMT. I'm not sure everyone is familiar with the term. Sure. So a GNT is a generation and transmission uh, cooperative. So uh, they, oh, rather than each cooperative owning generation assets and and transmission assets, um, those are owned by a, a generation and transmission uh, cooperative uh, or provider, I guess, within the, within the state. Uh, so they will develop a portfolio that meets the requirements. Um, and desires, I guess, of of the individual cooperatives uh, that are members of that uh, GNT or, or generation transmission cooperative. So across our service territory, we have uh, three member districts. We have a governing board uh, made up of nine board members, three from each district, uh, each district representing approximately one third of our, our total number of members. Uh, we have five divisions uh, or, or technically divisions uh, throughout our service territory uh, in order to serve this, this broad expanse of territory. Uh, we also have a couple of additional locations. Uh, we have uh, uh, stores or warehouse locations on Mackin Island and Drummond Island. Just it's difficult to get things out there uh, if needed in a, a, a short period of time. Uh, we have one service center now. Uh, we do have member services personnel in a couple of the other locations uh, or, or divisions uh, out there, but we do have one member service center location. Uh, that is in Dafter, uh, just south of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, we also have uh, at that location engineering, purchasing and stores, uh, a number of other operations uh, at that location as well. Uh, our main administrative functions, uh, we serve that uh, those out of an office in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Uh, we also have a hydroelectric plant that we own uh, on the St. Mary River, St. Mary's River uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And again, as mentioned earlier, uh, we do serve a, a pretty significant number of islands. Uh, I believe, I, I'm sure this is probably still true, but I think uh, we've, we've touted that we serve the, the most islands of any cooperative within the United States. Uh, from a size standpoint, then, uh, we're about 150 megawatts of peak load and we are winter peaking. Uh, in order in order to uh, serve that load or meet that capacity requirement, uh, we have a number of different resources. Uh, we have a, approximately a 30 megawatt hydro facility, again, located on the St. Mary's River that is owned by Cloverland. We have a longer term PPA uh, with the U US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they have a hydro facility uh, that serves the locks and uh, their other administrative uh, buildings and things on the St. Mary's River and, and other uh, places in our service territory. Um, but any of the additional uh, power from their hydro facility that uh, they don't need for their own purposes, uh, we purchase from them. Uh, we also have approximately 10 megawatts of diesel units. Uh, located across our service territory, uh, but a majority of the capacity resources that we have for meeting our MISO requirements or our capacity demonstration uh, that we have to do um, with the state of Michigan every year, uh, that is met through a long-term PPA uh, that we have with We Energies in Wisconsin. Uh, one of the things that we do not have that we are working on here and, and hopefully developing shortly is a demand response program. Uh, so historically, uh, we haven't had anything that has been recognized here as something that uh, would benefit uh, our members uh, and um, allow us to uh, avoid uh, additional uh, generation construction potentially. So uh, that is one area that we're working on. 
So from a, a transmission perspective, and I guess uh, talking about when we when we think of the UP, we, we sometimes think of um, how isolated uh, we may be. Um, and that is is true to some respect, I think, in the eastern part of the UP and 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 some of the things that we hear and see from ATC um, really kind of shed a light on that. And so uh, the information here is from ATC's 10 year assessment uh, for planning zone two. So that encompasses uh, a majority uh, of the UP, uh, just with the exception of the far west uh, that's under uh, northern states power um, control. So uh, direct uh, quotes, I guess, or, or information from the ATC perspective is that we have a limited ability to import or export power. Uh, so that is something somewhat of a concern, uh, say that we have uh, a generation uh, trip or uh, maybe we have our, our one of our interconnection or one of our ties to the west or to the south go down. Uh, that could be a concern uh, for us, uh, potential generator instability. And as you saw before uh, in the previous slide, a majority of our capacity um, is really coming under a, a long term PPA uh, with a with we energies in Wisconsin. And so um, we just don't have the generation in the eastern part of the UP in order to support uh, the load that we have up here should we lose uh, ties to the west or ties to the south. Um, and low and high system voltages as well. And so uh, the map here from ATC is just showing uh, the interconnection uh, or with the UP, we've got uh, a two circuit common pole tie to the west. Uh, and then we also have two circuits uh, running under the straits. Um, one is, as we all know, was damaged uh, back in 2018, uh, and that is being replaced now by ATC, uh, hopefully up here soon. So um, that is that was obviously a, a major concern for us at the time, um, and really uh, shed a light or, or expose maybe some of the weaknesses uh, that we have here in the UP. Um, and Cloverland is uh, is ready to willing and act. It, on uh, on some of those weaknesses and uh, as you'll hear about later on. Uh, so from an energy resource standpoint though, a uh, majority of the energy, uh, just a, a very slight majority of the energy um, is under a long-term or served under a long-term PPA with we energies out of Wisconsin. And that delivery point is, is Wisconsin. So any of the, uh, we rely on transmission in order to uh, deliver that power to uh, Cloverland service territory. Um, and so any anything impacting uh, that transmission system obviously is a concern for us. Um, but as we look at uh, the significance of the hydro resources, if you add up both our owned hydro uh, and the hydro PPA, uh, even as well as uh, some of the um, renewable energy that is assigned to us under our long term PPA uh, that we have uh, with We Energies in Wisconsin, we have been uh, over the past couple of years either approaching or just slightly above 50% renewable, uh, both hydro, solar, biomass um, in very small portions. So um, we're we're generating a, a majority, I guess, of of the energy or of our of our energy requirements from our hydro facilities. Uh, here is just a, a little bit uh, a more specific slide on that. And so as you look at the uh, the blue uh, areas at the bottom for each uh, particular year there, that is the hydro generation. So uh, we're looking at uh, back to 2014, uh, water flows through our facility uh, and through the core, uh, water levels in Lake Superior were down uh, compared to where they are now. Uh, we're looking at about 43% uh, of our energy requirements coming from uh, the hydro two hydro facilities on the St. Mary's River. Now we're at actually at just uh, just under 49 percent. Um, and as you see, there's a there has been a decline in coal over time. Uh, coal is represented here or um, included here uh, because it is part of the uh, the long term PPA that we have. Um, but as we energies has been uh, changing out their coal facilities with uh, with natural gas, uh, we've seen a decline in coal uh, replacing that with natural gas. Hey, Aaron. Yes. Uh, Mike from Ask the city of Escanaba. I, I see you've got all these your fuel mix as percentages. Um, how's your load been doing? Has it been holding steady or declining? No, we've seen uh, obviously weather dependent, but I would say weather normalized. We've been seeing just a, a very slight decline uh, over time. 
So yeah, pretty typical, uh, I think, for uh, for our area is about maybe a 1% uh, decline in load. Uh, we have had uh, some changes, though, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, we we had a one of our major customers uh, switch to an alternative energy supplier. So you know, that was a pretty significant decrease for us. But absent that, uh, we're, we're, we're either seeing flat or trending down slightly. Okay. I think that pretty... Sure, and I think that kind of holds true um, with, uh, I believe, early on um, in the process last year, uh, the task force had someone, I think, from Michigan Tech um, do a, a study uh, and present information. I think we saw that really the only two areas that were growing um, in the UP were the Marquette and the Houghton areas. And so you know, we we kind of used that as a, a, a guideline, I guess, or a goalpost. And, and once we saw that in our historical numbers, um, you know, made it pretty easy to accept, um, you know, a future that, uh, that represents presented a, a slight decline like that. Thank you. Uh, Cloverlands Hydro Facility. Uh, so this is, uh, as you see the picture here, you can uh, you can understand that this is really our, our pride and joy. Uh, it's a hydroelectric plant that was uh, completed and put into service in 1902, uh, I believe originally owned by Union Carbide. Uh, it's a quarter mile long facility. Uh, there, we have 74 turbines, uh, approximately between 28 and 30 megawatts. Uh, nameplate, I believe, is around 40 megawatts uh, for this facility. Um, again, locally owned and operated uh, by Cloverland and our staff. Uh, the power canal uh, that serves uh, that facility uh, was uh, also created or, or built, constructed in 1902, uh, and that uh, winds up connecting the higher portion of the St. Mary's River uh, to the lower uh, section of the St. Mary's River. And so uh, essentially created an island um, at the corner here, top part of Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and that serves our hydro facility. Um, essentially the way this works is um, the the water that flows through the St. Mary's River is first allocated uh, both 50% to Canada, 50% to the U.S. And then uh, the first portion of that water, the 50% that's allocated to the U.S. is allocated to uh, the locks, as you can understand, uh, to facilitate trade. And um, then anything after that um, is split between uh, our facility here and the, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and their hydro facility. So uh, there is an allocation uh, that we have to manage to on a monthly basis. Um, given the high water uh, levels in Lake Superior, uh, we have seen uh, an increase uh, in our hydro generation over the past several years. Uh, however, not much as not as much as you would maybe expect, um, given the higher water levels on Lake Huron as well, um, that has uh, reduced the uh, drop, I guess, or the increased head on the on downstream um, has increased or decreased the efficiency of the facility somewhat. But we're still seeing um, really kind of record water flows through that facility um, here in the recent uh, recent past. Yeah, Aaron, so, it's, it's yes. crucial. I'm just curious as as hopefully the Corps of Engineers expands the lock capacity uh, up at Sault Ste. Marie, will that um, affect your hydro plant at all by diverting more water into the um, to the locks or is that a wash? Yeah, we're not expecting that to be so. Um, our understanding, I guess, is the any work that uh, will be done in construction on the locks will essentially be taking two locks. Um, and replacing them with one larger lock. So essentially the same amount of water uh, used for the locks. So I, I don't think that that will have much of an impact itself. Okay, thanks. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, so from a, you can you can understand then uh, from a renewable uh, standpoint, we since we do have a significant uh, amount of our energy requirements uh, that do come from the hydro facilities uh, and then some from solar and other renewables. Um, that we do have a significant uh, renewable energy credit portfolio as well. Uh, as you can see here, um, just the recs from our, our owned hydro facility uh, is enough for us to meet the RPS requirement um, with a significant amount of uh, reserve. So um, we all, since we also do receive um, 
recs through the uh, hydro PPA uh, and then also through our long term PPA uh, with we energies. Uh, we do have a, a significant excess of renewable energy credits over and above our renewable uh, requirement every year. Uh, so what we do is uh, attempt to monetize those as much as possible um, and have been pretty successful on that front. So uh, we sell those to uh, other um, folks that have uh, needs for uh, for those throughout the state. Uh, so obviously one of the things uh, that is uh, is of concern, I guess, and always talk about is rates. Uh, Cloverland uh, looks at this on a, a dollar per kilowatt hour standpoint, uh, takes any uh, usage variation really out of the equation. Uh, the information that's presented in the table here uh, is really from uh, the 2019 uh, cons uh, Cub report um, that I believe only went through 2017. So some of the information is a little bit stale uh, in here, but uh, just ranks and, and shows the dollar per kilowatt hour rate in 2017 uh, for all of the uh, co-ops uh, and I guess, I'm sorry, all of the electric providers uh, that are in the UP. And so uh, you can see uh, Cloverland, we're at about, from a residential standpoint, about 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so we're third uh, behind Northern States Power and Escanaba. Uh, from a commercial uh, standpoint, we're about 10 and a half cents, so we're second. Uh, from an industrial, we're at 8.2, so we're third. And, and overall, um, if you combine all the rates together, we're, we're second. So uh, that's something that uh, we've been proud of. Obviously, there's things that uh, we need to work on from a reliability standpoint, um, and that, uh, that comes at additional cost. But uh, from a rate standpoint, um, we've been pretty successful at keeping rates low. Um, and over the past several years, uh, from 2017 actually was the last time we had done a quote unquote rate case and a rate change. Uh, we have not changed rates uh, since 2017 and uh, we don't expect to change rates for 2021 and we're looking at 2022 at this point. So uh, just looking at the company and, and ways that we can uh, shift some costs around and, and focus on some different areas um, has been uh, helpful to us and, and we've been successful in, in keeping rates at the levels uh, that we've we've had since 2017. And so at that, uh, that uh, really ends any formal uh, part of the presentation. I just wanted to open it up for any additional questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was a great presentation. Uh, additional questions for Aaron? Madam Chair, I have a question. Please. Tony Ritaski, Aaron, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, a couple questions, actually. How many employees does Cloverland have at this point, or roughly? Uh, roughly 115. Is there still discussion about um, a couple of rice units over under under your purview? There, there is discussion. Um, you, I believe, uh, in one of the earlier presentations, or, or maybe it came up um, as part of ATC's discussion. Uh, there is a 50 megawatt uh, natural gas generator that is in the MISO queue uh, that is in uh, located in Dafter. Uh, that is Cloverlands. Uh, so we do have a, a generation project in the MISO queue. Uh, that is really the result of, uh, I guess, and this is important to note, uh, even though Cloverland as a cooperative were not required to complete a, an IRP or an integrated resource plan uh, as part of in recognizing some of the vulnerabilities that uh, we had when uh, the Straits cable uh, was damaged back in 2018. Uh, we did complete a, an integrated resource plan uh, that identified that uh, there are some areas for opportunity uh, generation wise within the Eastern UP uh, that led to then uh, the 50 megawatt generation uh, proposal or project uh, being submitted to MISO. We have uh, several other things that we're working on as well now uh, that we'll hope to be able to announce uh, here pretty pretty soon. Thank you. Aaron, this is Tanya Peslowski. I'm curious, that was a good lead into my question about IRPs, but I'm curious what your longer term planning process looks like. How far out do you go? How often do you do it? Sure, we're looking at now, at least from a financial standpoint at this uh, this period of time, we're looking as far as 30 years out. 
um, in order to try, obviously, I mean, nothing's perfect that far out, but just trying to anticipate uh, what's going on. Uh, we do look out uh, be anywhere between four and 10 years from a, a, a capital spending standpoint. Um, we are also completing uh, several studies right now that are looking longer term at uh, maintenance requirements on the hydro facility, um, vegetation management uh, and vegetation control uh, within our service territory and, and what uh, types of cycles we should be on for different areas of our territory. So um, we are looking out longer term at this point, um, trying to plan uh, again as we as we start to you know, with the IRP and and as we start to look out from a generation standpoint, um, our contract with We Energies ends in 2029. So we have to uh, plan for uh, the correct number of uh, resources and, and capacity that we need, um, not only now uh, but also uh, going out into 2029. So we're, we're we're looking out as far as we possibly can here now um, with any and and trying to get what we uh, see what we can see, I guess, um, with some sort of certainty more in the year in the near term but um, again as far out as possible Adam this is uh, Prasad from uh, Synergy uh, great presentation um, you mentioned about hey. your monitor Prasad your sorry we on we're only taking questions from task force members right oh, now Oh, sorry sorry Wait. okay okay that's fine yeah sorry sorry yeah uh, uh, I have this, a this, this. go ahead Jen thanks um on that question of um, reliability, it's certainly been a challenge with the changes of weather and the heavier wet storms. I know um, we've certainly been suffering with it in Marquette County. Um, could you say maybe a little bit more in that in terms of your planning process, uh, what you're planning to do and how um, that might impact rates and choices of generation? Sure, definitely. Um, as we obviously weather was a had a big impact last year and i think we saw from upco's presentation in july uh cloverland uh, if i remember right it was a yellow line uh, we saw a spike in 2019. Uh, not only was cloverland impacted by the thanksgiving snowstorm but um, something that impacted our service territory almost specifically within the up um, was uh, a major ice storm that hit uh, right before New Year's. And so uh, the spike really for Cloverland, as far as a Sadie standpoint, was really was was due to that. Um, what we're what we're looking at now, again, as I mentioned, we've got a one of the one of the things that is is always easy to look at. Um, as we as we look at our costs, our overall costs and and ability to uh, to maintain rates uh, where they are, uh, you can look at the easy things to cut would be say tree trimming, uh, vegetation management. Uh, that's one thing that has now as we've focused really on our historical safety safety reliability numbers. Um, vegetation management is is a concern uh, when you look at the outages across our service territory. Majority of those are caused by trees. Uh, so that uh, we have in the over the past couple of years increased our vegetation management budget significantly. Um, but the way that we've done that is really by taking a look at our power supply costs. And so uh, because our we've been able to achieve some savings from a power cost standpoint, we've been able to shift some of those dollar savings over to other areas of the business. And one of those specifically has been in vegetation management. Um, again, we're doing a, a study now that is uh, looking, uh, taking a wholesale look at our service territory. Um, it'll help us determine uh, and, and inform us on um, what areas of our service territory need more attention, what types of uh, clearing and cutting cycles uh, that we, uh, we will need to maintain uh, in order to not only not maintain where we are from a reliability standpoint, but enhance it. So uh, we hope to have that uh, that assessment done here within the next month or so. Thank you. Uh, this is Douglas Jester. Um, Aaron, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I apologize for that, but I think it's important. Um, I'm, I would like you to compare the, the cost structures um, for Cloverland, which has relatively low rates, and UPCO, uh, which has relatively high rates. Um, a couple of points of background for everyone. Uh, Aaron used to work for the holding company that uh, owned and managed UPCO until their sale a few years ago. Uh, and Cloverland uh, files uh, publicly accessible uh, 
financial reports to the Rural Utility Service, uh, UPCO files uh, what's called FERC Form 1. So I'm not asking Aaron to talk about anything that's not public information. So what, in your view, what aspect of the cost structure of the two utilities explains the rather extraordinary difference in rates? Sure. Well, honestly, Douglas, I'll, I'll give you my politically correct responses. I, I really haven't gone through it and done the analysis to determine exactly what the differences are. Um, you know, I mean, I think just from a high level, though, um, if you look at, I, I would say, without really giving away maybe too much, um, you know, from a high level, we don't pay it, taxes. Um, so taxes don't have to be borne by uh, the members and incorporated into the revenue requirement. Uh, there's no uh, ROE uh, necessarily uh, out there as well. Um, you know, but I think really one of the things that um, is 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 critical and that is uh, it, it kind of reflects or goes back to the ROE is Cloverland has a, a different capital structure as well. I think if you look at the public information uh, and you go all the way back to 2013 or even before that, um, compare and contrast Cloverland's um, capital structure, meaning equity, uh, amount of equity um, using to or being used uh, in order to support the business and, and business investment, um, compare and contrast that to UPCO. So Cloverland was at 15% from an equity standpoint. So if you look at what it takes to maybe earn a return on that 15%, um, it's not much. Um, but is that a safe level? It's it's really not. Um, so one of the things we've been trying to do is, is increase that amount, uh, that equity ratio really pretty significantly uh, in order to get us into a position where now we see 2029, we're able to deal with maybe some vendors from an energy standpoint that uh, we wouldn't be able to deal with uh, given where we were before. So. You know, one of the things I think really, though, is is the return, um, in my opinion. I think we just, Cloverland doesn't necessarily have a, a an ideal or uh, an allowed return and a target that we need to hit. Um, and so, you know, because of that, I think we've, for a number of years, um, been able really to, I'm not going to say, well, for lack of a better term, I guess, kind of skate by uh, maybe with uh, some lower um, margin numbers uh, than really would be ideal uh, for a business our size and, and the risks that we have. Um, but, you know, other than that, I guess I haven't really gone back and and compared and contrast. I mean, I we do look at, obviously, like you do, we look at the rates. Um, you know, we do have a, a goal, obviously, to um, provide the best rates for our members. But other than that, because the any margin that we do earn goes back to the members, uh, there really is no objective, I guess, to while we want to maximize that and be as efficient as possible, there's no real objective to maximize that return for the benefit of, of others. Thank you. All right. Well, people are thinking of questions if they have any more for Aaron. Aaron, you mentioned that you lost a big choice customer a couple of years ago. I want to say, if I remember correctly, you guys are at the 10% cap. Can you talk a little bit about choice and the impact sure. that that plays? Yes, uh, it, we are subject to uh, the choice uh, legislation. And so uh, we did have one customer that chose to leave. Uh, that was uh, UP Paper. Uh, they are a large paper mill in Manistique. Uh, they, that one customer uh, makes up, or one member uh, makes up the full 10% of the, of the choice cap. Um, so, you know, there's been, there's been talk internally of, well, you know, we should try and, and maybe get that customer back. Um, you know, that would be an option, sure, but um, it's really just going to open up that 10% uh, to others. And so, um, they're they're kind of happy where they're at, and I there's not necessarily a, a lot of margin uh, from that one customer either, and so I think we're kind of happy in the position we're into, and um, I think from a, a competitive standpoint as well, um, it's really only the when we when we think about choice, it's not that the entire uh, load had shifted uh, to a another service provider, and so that is only the energy portion uh, of the rates that we charge so there's still a, a demand uh, charge uh, there's still uh, the distribution rates uh, that get charged to that uh, that customer or that member um, so i think it's really it, it's not much of a, a concern i guess or a question for us um, competitively again i think as we as we look at our energy prices, um, you know that is one area of opportunity for us to improve upon. Um, I think in order to uh, make sure that we are competitive uh, or more competitive from that standpoint going forward. 
Awesome, thanks. Other questions for Aaron? Yep, this is this is Michael Larson. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Aaron. Uh, one of my questions is really what is what is the given your low rates, what is the demand for kind of member led generation, you know, self generating? Uh, question one and then question two, kind of that follow up is, you know, how does how does Cloverland take into kind of future planning, kind of the thought about electrification and potentially like EVs, things along things along those lines? OK, sure. Um, from a, a member driven uh, or, or member owned uh, generation, um, because of the, our rates where they're at, um, you know, we've seen in for other utilities um, that uh, there, the utilities will hit the the one or two percent cap uh, relatively quickly. Um, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, um, but we're not anywhere close really to that one percent cap at this point in time. And so I think that's a reflection uh, really of the rates, um, and it also may be a reflection um, really just of the uh, ability maybe of. Uh, the folks within our our service territory um, to to kind of take on that investment. Um, you know, we are we do struggle. Uh, that's one of the concerns and one of the uh, reasons that we try and maintain the the low rates is that uh, we look at affordability for our members. And so as we look at uh, you know perhaps the the investment in a, a solar structure uh, at a residential or a, a, a rural type uh, um, type area, uh, it just the ability, I guess, to uh, to afford uh, that may not uh, may not be there. And, and again, given the given the low rates, uh, the payback period on on something like that uh, just may not be uh, something that uh, that is interesting, I guess, to uh, to the customers or the members. Um, as we look at uh, EVs in the future, uh, Cloverland does, uh, I, I'm not sure how uh, many of you know this, Cloverland does have a couple of testing, auto testing facilities in its, in, in its service territory. And so uh, they are now looking at uh, EVs uh, and electrification. Um, one of the difficulties really has been uh, batteries performance uh, in cold weather environments. And I think that uh, that really has has hindered uh, some of the investment uh, and, and switch or change to uh, EVs up here in the very far north. Um, but I think it's it's coming and that's what we're hearing. We're, we're in touch with uh, those testing facilities um, and uh, and making sure, I guess, that we're um, providing what they need in order for them to continue their testing, obviously, in environments like uh, like we operate in. Um, and, and we'll hear, you know, kind of from them how that's going. Um, but there really hasn't been much of a push for it up here, I think, just because of the of the battery performance uh, in the cold weather environments. But it's something that is on our radar uh, that we're looking forward to. And, uh, you know, if it is something that uh, there is a push for an interest from our members, it's something we'd be looking at developing. Thing. Yeah, infrastructure will be an important part of that because I know Norway's at like 55% of EV adoption. So, you know, there's ways to mitigate the battery performance issues. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Right. I have a, one more question if no one else has a question. Go ahead, Jen. Um, well, it's actually two parts. One, um, could you, if, you know, you're standing at Whitefish Point or even in Brimley and you look across the bay there and you see enormous windmills on the Ontario side. And so the generation that's happening on the Ontario side is seems to be quite different than what's happening in your territory. I wondered if you could comment on that and on that study that was done that saw that there was no benefit to try to connect the two. And then um, I did also, I was looking back, um, there's no mention of the Ontonagan Rural Electric Co-op on the rates. And I wondered, why that was sure sure let me hit that one first that's uh that one's pretty easy there was no information in the cub report that went out i believe past 2014 or 15 for ontonagan um so i'm not sure why uh that is but yes i mean i think if you add ontonagan to that mix um i believe their rates are, are near the top end of the range uh there as well um as far as the the interconnection uh study with canada uh if i recall correctly, uh, there was a study uh, that was uh, done by MISO at the request of the state of Michigan, uh, looking at connecting with Canada, whether there would be any benefit uh, to that. I think when, uh, when you looked at that report, um, ultimately what came out of that is 
there the economic benefit of connecting to Canada um, and transmission line to Canada in order to draw power from there uh, versus just siting generation uh, in either the the northern part of the lower peninsula or uh, in the eastern part of the upper peninsula. Um, it was really, uh, I think, the economic benefit of, of generation um, within the U.S. and within the MISO footprint, specifically northern uh, lower lower peninsula, uh, eastern UP, um, was better. It, there, it just it made more sense to actually have the generation on this side. Uh, cost effectiveness just wasn't there. Um, so uh, and that kind of bore out in uh, Cloverland's IRP as well when we talk about uh, wind and and solar uh, facilities. Uh, when we look at, we we have to look at a couple of different time frames from an IRP standpoint, and and how we plan for things. We have a a contract now, a long term power contract with We Energies in Wisconsin, uh, whereby it states that any power that we don't generate on our own has to be purchased from Wisconsin or from under that We Energies contract, and that's that's it. So um, we're kind of born, we're, we're beholden, I guess, to that agreement uh, that was signed at the time of the uh, the acquisition of Vedison Sioux uh, by Cloverland. And so we're, we are doing things to try and, and operate and, and function kind of around that contract and, and strategically, I guess, look at opportunities um, within our service territory. I think we'll, we'll have a couple of things that we're looking to announce uh, soon. Um, you know, not large scale wind developments or, or large scale solar or anything like that, but definitely some developments coming coming up. Um, you know, again, it's just something that has been difficult. I think we, you know, the progress on that front would be different uh, were it not for this long-term power contract that we have. And so, um, you know, that really has hindered uh, some opportunities that we've had in the past. And I think just a different viewpoint um, on what Cloverland could or, or could not do, um, what we were willing to accept. And so um, just a different, uh, different mindset, different uh, strategy here. I think you'll see some things come out, but uh, the IRP, though, um, you know, as we talked about it, um, you know, as we're really looking at um, reliability, uh, one of the things that uh, really bore out was the the renewables from a reliability standpoint um, didn't provide as much benefit to say a natural gas facility um, that has peaking capabilities has. Uh, it, fast start, uh, fast ramping capabilities. So, um, you know, that bore out to be the, or, or was shown to be, have the most economic benefit for the members. Um, but there are a couple of the scenarios in an IRP, there's multiple scenarios that were were run. I think we, we actually settled on 11. Um, there was some benefit from, from solar. Uh, there was some benefit from looking at uh, battery storage as well. Um, but as, uh, as we uh, talked about, I think with uh, Mike Fermansky's presentation, I think the cost uh, benefit just wasn't there uh, now, uh, but we are continuing to look at that. Um, again, you mentioned Canada right across the river. Uh, they actually do have a solar with battery storage storage facility over there. Um, but as we look at, I guess, the economic benefit now um, under this WEC contract compared to, say, 2029, um, I think we're going to have to wait on that a little bit. That it's just it's too difficult right now to to show that there's a, a an economic benefit uh, to the members. Obviously, and there's an environmental benefit for sure. But, um, you know, I think the, the economic, uh, the cost far away is the benefit at this point. O to be a We Energy shareholder. Thank you. Well, I, we are we are working on it. So yeah, <laughs> you're, you're with us, these uh, these things uh, are are uh, generally planned very very long term, and uh, we've been at it for a couple of years now. But we've got some pretty exciting things I think that we'll be able to announce pretty soon. Thank you. Other questions for Aaron? Aaron, uh, this is Roman Sidertsov. Thank you very much for your. Uh, presentation, very informative indeed, and I'm a big fan of your hydroelectric facility. Aaron, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on any changes in your customer base and in your demand that are not necessarily related to the uh, choice uh, legislation. Has it remained stable? Uh, you know, what, what the demand has been, sort of that part, uh, if you would. Thank you. Yes, if you if you strip out the uh, the customer choice and and you strip out EO, um, we've really seen a, a, a pretty flat 
load profile and, and load shape. So it, we've been pretty pretty steady here for the past several years, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing going forward. Um, obviously, we've we've taken a hit uh, from uh, the pandemic. Now um, we've seen anywhere from five to ten percent, uh, roughly decrease in load, uh, depending on the on the customer class or member class. Um, obviously, more from an industrial standpoint, um, more from a large commercial, uh, small commercial, um, with a, a minor change or even sometimes an uptick uh, in residential uh, usage. So, uh, just reflective of, of more of the stay at home environment that we're in now. But um, you know, that's that's definitely uh, something that we'll have to watch here going forward, and hopefully we're we're kind of out from under this. But yeah, relatively though, I mean. If you if you just kind of look at uh, at Cloverland, um, you know, kind of stripping out some of those uh, some of those one offs, were were really pretty flat. Thank you. All right, Aaron, I think you're off the hot seat. Hope it wasn't too hot. We do appreciate it. I think it was a very good uh, presentation on Cloverland, and actually ties in nicely to Douglas's presentation. So, thank, well, thank you. you for the opportunity. Yes, um, I hope you don't mind if uh, task force members have additional questions that they can follow up with you too. Not at all, anytime. Great, thank you, sir. All right, um, next on our agenda is Douglas Jester, and he has a presentation that hopefully everybody has received in advance. Um, we're working, endeavoring to try to get you all uh, presentations in advance. And while he is sharing, is it working? And we'll hand it off to Douglas. <laughs> I think it's working slowly, right. so give me a I moment to uh, there. All right, very good. So good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I am Douglas Jester. I'm a, the managing partner of Five Lakes Energy um, and a member of the task force. Um, my purpose in proposing this presentation uh, is that we you know, we spent a year doing our assigned report on propane, and then we've taken a deep dive uh, into electricity, which I think was very appropriate. But we're now about six months away from uh, when we're supposed to deliver our final report uh, to the governor. And I think it's time for us to begin to think about our priorities for that report. So I wanted to um, do this presentation uh, both to back off a bit from propane and electricity and uh, provide an, uh, a factual overview of UP Energy uh, and then to draw from that some suggestions on the task force priorities uh, for the next few months. Uh, the decision about those priorities, of course, is up to the task force. These are just my suggestions. Um, I'm going to present a fair amount of data. And I just want to acknowledge or first say that it's all uh, really from publicly available sources. Um, we've patched together what I think is a fairly accurate picture of 2020. Uh, but for example, the, the price comparison information is 2018. Uh, it really just depends on what is available through these publicly available sources. And I want to acknowledge uh, contributions of uh, Catherine Seema and David Gard um, from Five Lakes for putting this together. Um, I don't want to, don't need to read this to you, but this is just a reminder of uh, our charge, um, assessing overall uh, energy needs and how they're currently met, formulating alternative solutions, and identifying and uh, evaluating potential changes uh, that could occur to energy supply and distribution in the UP. And so uh, I've really structured uh, this presentation uh, roughly around uh, that assignment. Um, first, this table is not really crucial to the, the rest of the presentation, but I think it's helpful. There are two things I uh, want to note other than just have the numbers available to you. One is that uh, it was not possible to piece together a count of industrial customers for the various heating fuels from publicly available data. Um, gas companies that serve the UP also serve other areas, things like that, and the, the data are not presented by those geographical breakdowns. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at the total residential electricity meter count, um, that will strike you as a bit high. 
Uh, and that's because there, in part, there are people who have uh, electric heat that is separately metered from the rest of the house or building um, in order to access a heating rate. Um, so that's one reason it's high. Even if you adjust for that, um, the official count of fuel oil, natural gas, propane, and wood customers falls short uh, of the count of uh, residences uh, in the UP. So there simply are some that we're, we don't, we don't have uh, good data for. And that's just, um, you know, a bit of a challenge. But I think qualitatively, um, the rest of the presentation is not really affected by this. Um, so th this slide presents a really broad picture of uh, fuel type um, in the UP. Um, and I believe I have just discovered that I have a wrong version. So I'm going to take a moment and just switch uh, to get the right version here. There we go. The label changed. Um, Douglas, can you make it? I will. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why it's. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I apologize for that uh, interruption. So in this slide, I'm showing uh, end use uh, energy by uh, what I'm identifying as fuel type. So electricity is shown here as electricity and uh, fuel used to produce electricity, you know, such as natural gas is not included. So just sort of a definition of terms. Um, and I know that we ordinarily measure electricity in kilowatt hours and propane in gallons and things like that. Uh, in order to have a sort of common measurement, uh, I'm using uh, millions of BTUs um, so that uh, we're really looking at like for like if they had if they were serving the same purpose uh, for the customer. Um, as you can see. On a BTU basis, um, gasoline and natural gas uh, are the two biggest uses, um, followed by electricity uh, and then diesel fuel. So if you look at the combination of gasoline and diesel fuel, um, most of which are used for transportation, that's roughly a third. Uh, if you look at electricity, um, you know, on an induced energy basis, that's in the neighborhood of 20%. Uh, and then the rest, uh, you know, sort of roughly 40% is heating fuels. If you look at it in terms of expenditures, the dollars paid by UP residents and businesses, uh, it is about one third electricity, um, just shy of half uh, transportation fuels. Uh, and then uh, in the neighborhood of 20% for heating fuels. So as we think about affordability, uh, it's obvious that we need to consider everything, but perhaps give particular consideration to um, electricity and transportation fuels. Um, as a kind of a proxy for all emissions, um, present carbon dioxide emissions here. Um, in calculating the carbon dioxide emissions from electricity, uh, you will see later that a portion of the electricity used in the UP is imported. Uh, and we have attributed carbon dioxide emissions to the imported electricity. So this is not just carbon dioxide emitted within the UP, uh, but also the carbon dioxide emitted to serve the UP. Um, and as you can see, again, uh, just under half uh, of the carbon dioxide emissions are from transportation fuels. Um, and, but here, a large share 
uh, is attributable to heating fuels, and then a smaller, relatively smaller share attributable to electricity. Although the electricity share of carbon dioxide is a little bit larger than the electricity share of end use uh, energy. So I think that's an important overall perspective. We're going to dig in a little bit uh, to this, but I, I think it helps in thinking about where our priorities might be. If you look at who uses energy in the UP, um, the residential customers um, are, you know, pretty consistently about 35% of energy expenditures and uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Transportation um, includes all forms of transportation, including private vehicles. So, you know, uh, that includes household uh, expenditures as well as commercial vehicles. Uh, so you just have to understand that in the interpretation. But again, uh, transportation is a large share of the BTUs, the expenditures and the uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And then uh, commercial is a somewhat smaller slice um, and industrial is even smaller. So that's the picture by the customary uh, classes, again, measured at the customer. If we look at each of these classes um, in a way similar to the, uh, the first of, of this series of slides, residential customers um, get a lot of their, uh, or a lot of their energy use is heating uh, fuels. Um, and electricity, those two combined are, you know, uh, about uh, 50, per, excuse me, um, electricity is, is less than 25% and heating fuels are about, um, you know, almost 80%. Uh, and the, again, this excludes the transportation use. This is just, you know, for their buildings and uh, the site energy. On the expenditure side, however, um, well over half of the uh, residential expenditures are for electricity. Uh, and then uh, the carbon dioxide emissions are a little bit higher for electricity than the end use energy from electricity, but otherwise very similar. If you look at um, commercial end use, um, it's somewhat similar to residential, but heavier to electricity. Uh, in energy expenditures and carbon dioxide. Now, industrial customers requires a little bit of uh, translation. Uh, as I will show you later, a number of the industrial customers generate their own electricity on site with cogeneration facilities. The fuels used in those cogeneration facilities are excluded um, from uh, the, this slide, uh, and instead the output of electricity from that cogeneration uh, is treated here as the uh, end use uh, energy. So as you can see, our industrial customers in the UP are very heavy to electricity um, if you exclude uh, those cogeneration facilities. If you look at uh, transportation, um, it's about 75% gasoline and about 25% diesel. That's true of energy expenditures and carbon dioxide emissions. Just a brief point, um, we're charged to look at the security of uh, energy supply to um, the UP. Some of that security is physical. We, we have certainly had significant discussions of, you know, the risk for supply disruption of propane and, and things of that kind. And similar talked about reliability of electricity supply. Another aspect of security is really the variability of the cost. And fossil fuels historically have been uh, pretty volatile. Um, so this slide is simply to make that point. Well, electricity prices have varied and electricity cost is a pretty
pretty high share of the total energy cost. Um, electricity prices are not as volatile as the direct fossil fuel prices. So let's look at electricity uh, in a bit more depth. Um, UP electricity sales by sector um, are about one third each uh, on an end use energy basis for residential, commercial, and industrial customers. And we attribute carbon dioxide equally. So the carbon dioxide um, shares are the same as the energy shares. If you look at the expenditures, however, um, the residential share is much higher. Commercial share is somewhat higher than uh, the commercial share of uh, energy, and then the industrial share is less. Um, that reflects that the residential rates are higher than commercial and commercial are, are higher than industrial. And that is largely because uh, industrial customers are uh, receiving their energy from transmission or very near transmission, so they pay much less for the distribution of electricity than uh, do the residential and uh, commercial customers. That's ordinary and common across the electric utility industry. Um, Aaron presented um, some UP only prices for 2017 from a, a report published by the Citizens Utility Board of Michigan. I actually prepared that report under contract uh, to them. Uh, the 2018 report is uh, soon to be released. Um, the reason that we're now in 2020 releasing 2018 is that we compare uh, prices and other data across the country based on uh, aggregation of those data by the US Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration, and they have significant time lags in publishing the data. So uh, we run this far behind. I think it's still um, a valid perspective. I am aware of the prices uh, in Michigan. And while there have been you know, some shifts and some material, uh, the general picture is still valid. So as you can see here uh, at the top, we have the, industri the investor owned utilities and then uh, the balance uh, of the slide is a combination of municipal and cooperative utilities. If you look at um, the investor-owned utilities, uh, UPCO has the highest residential rates in the state, followed by consumers in DTE, and then UMERC, uh, and at the very bottom, Northern States Power. Uh, so one takeaway from this is that electricity rates are not uniformly high in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, they, in fact, vary quite a bit across utilities. Um, similarly, if you look at uh, the cooperatives and uh, municipal utilities. Um, Cloverland uh, is, you know, fairly far uh, down the graph here, fairly low, uh, while uh, Bayfield and Alger Delta are, are pretty high. Uh, so again, a range of results. Um, City of Escanaba is also uh, down there, um, even below Cloverland while Marquette is you know, relatively near the top. So um, in order to understand electricity pricing, we really need to think about individual utilities to some extent. If you look at the commercial prices, and I should explain, you know, electricity pricing, there are monthly, monthly fixed fees and kilowatt hour charges, and for larger customers, something called a demand charge. What we're looking here at here is total revenue from the class divided by total electricity provided to the class. So it sort of averages out the particular pricing mechanisms. So the commercial uh, sector is, uh, UPCO is again at the top, but now UMERC is relatively high and um, DTE is you know near the bottom of the investor owned utilities. Uh, the same general pattern of prices applies uh, to the uh, municipal and co cooperative group as with the residential customers, though again, there are some uh, minor changes of position. 
If you look at the industrial sector, uh, UPCO is now uh, the lowest uh, average price of the investor-owned utilities in the state. Um, WEPCO is shown here because uh, as of 2018, they were still serving uh, the Cliffs Mines. Um, they have since closed Presque Isle uh, and uh, service to the mines has transitioned over to UMERC, um, which would take Wisconsin Electric out uh, of the picture here in Michigan um, and probably cause a minor adjustment in UMERC's um, average price and position uh, on this graph. It's worth noting as well that the industrial prices are relatively uniform with only Indiana, Michigan consumers and UPCO deviating much from the average. On the other hand, when you look at uh, the cooperatives and municipals, um, there's a fair amount of variation in industrial uh, prices. Uh, and at this point, uh, Cherryland has a relatively high industrial price, um, while uh, some city of, of Escanaba is still you know, relatively low. A number of the uh, Upper Peninsula and municipal utilities lack customers that are classified as industrial, so they don't appear uh, on this slide. So what we can conclude about the cost of electricity is that UP industrial rates are comparatively low. Um, some UP, UP utilities have competitive residential and commercial rates and others are very high. Uh, and just, an observation that high cost is not necessarily caused by far-flung distribution. Uh, you can compare UPCO and Cloverland, which are roughly the same size in both uh, customer count and uh, area, have you know sort of similar scales of distribution systems, things like that. Digging a little deeper, um, Electricity <coughs> costs are typically divided between generation and transmission costs and other system costs, which would include distribution and sort of corporate overhead, things like that. Um, generation and transmission costs vary a little bit between customer classes because they have different uh, time patterns of use, but fundamentally um, they all are paying roughly the same cost for the generation of electricity and bringing it into the area. The differences between them are largely, as I said earlier, in the cost of distribution and uh, other services. If we contemplate changes in the uh, amount of electricity used, most of the costs of, say, an increase in electricity uh, usage would be generation and transmission costs. Um, places where, for example, uh, significant adoption of electric vehicles has been done have not had to spend a great deal more on distribution. So as we think about, and I'm going to do this in a moment, potential for fuel switching to electricity, it's important to understand that the Retail price of electricity is not the same as the incremental cost of using more electricity. And in fact, in the UP, where we have, you know, rates, uh, retail rates for commercial and residential customers that are in the 10 to 25 cent range, um, only a bit over four cents per kilowatt hour of that is generation and transmission costs, uh, which is why. Uh, industrial costs are only a little bit above uh, four cents kilowatt hour. That that number, that 4.16 cents per kilowatt hour uh, average will be important uh, in some of the remaining slides. If you look at the supply of electricity in the UP, um, the pie chart on the left shows that roughly a quarter is from net imports. So that would be um, 
in particular, the imports that Cloverland has from Wisconsin uh, that Aaron talked about. Um, currently, a similar uh, level of imports to UPCO uh, and some imports to um, other uh, of the utilities as well. Roughly another quarter is industrial cogeneration. So this would be facilities at an industrial site that typically burn a fuel, and we're going to talk about those in a moment, and both produce electricity and take the remaining heat that's not used in the production of electricity and use it uh, as process heat um, in, in the industrial process. And then roughly half of the electricity consumed in the UP is supplied by UP utility generation, either owned or uh, contracted, but generated within the UP. If you look at the uh, electric utility sales, so um, this would be excluding the imports and the industrial cogeneration. Um, hydroelectric generation is just a bit under half. Natural gas is a bit under half. Uh, and uh, a little bit of uh, other fuels uh, are used to make up the balance. Um, you know, particularly wind and wood. If you look at, in, at the industrial cogeneration fuel mix, about half of that is black liquor. So, you know, these are cogenerators at uh, paper mills. Um, and then the balance is a mixture of uh, a small amount of coal, a fair amount of natural gas, uh, and some uh, oil-derived uh, fuels, and a fair amount of wood uh, and waste wood. So that's how we are supplying electricity to the UP today. Um, there are certainly many, including me, who are interested in uh, increasing the use of renewables. Um, there's a, an investment advisory firm called uh, Lazard that has for the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, published uh, a statistical summary of the costs of various forms of generation. Levelized cost of energy is just a calculation that sort of averages the costs of generation over the full life cycle of a generator and accounts for differences in when costs occur and how long a particular facility will last, things like that. I'm going to show you in a minute what the trends have been, but this is their most recent analysis, which is essentially based on uh, 2019, well, it's 2019 publications, 20, mostly 2018 data. And the bars represent sort of ranges of prices uh, as you look around the country um, for the you know, particular form of generation uh, that is in the row. And as you can see, um, solar PV at utility scale uh, is now in the range of 32 to 42 dollars um, per megawatt hour levelized cost. Um, for those not used to making these conversions, that's 3.2 to 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, wind is 28 to 54. If you look at what they label as conventional, or essentially, you know, the kinds of generation we've been doing for a while, uh, new coal, nuclear, and gas peaking are way more costly than utility scale solar or wind. Um, and those are roughly competitive with gas combined cycle. Um, and that indeed is what we see in the marketplace. Um, although in the UP, we're using reciprocating engines for various technical reasons, um, they are essentially uh, in this sort of gas combined cycle um, category. So new generation all around the country uh, that is being developed is almost entirely utility scale solar and wind uh, and uh, more efficient forms of natural gas. 
the um, diamonds that are shown here uh, for nuclear and coal uh, reflect the costs of continuing to operate existing plants. And so you can see here that uh, wind and solar are approaching cost competitiveness with continuing to operate some of the traditional plants. Uh, and indeed, you see in the marketplace in the, in those parts of the country where uh, wholesale generation is strictly competitive, um, that nuclear and coal plants are being squeezed into retirement um, effectively through bankruptcy or being shed by their owners because they are not uh, economical. We are here today because of the declines shown on this graph. Um, just a point about looking at this graph, you know, it looks like the pace of improvement is dropping off. That because the graph is dominated by, you know, the large declines in price from the past. If you were to look at this as percentage declines year over year, um, we are still seeing price declines that are almost as rapid as they were, uh, say, eight to 10 years ago. So um, we are not really at uh, stable prices uh, for solar or wind. Um, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory annually publishes something called an annual technology baseline that provides uh, informed projections of future costs. And um, we expect to continue to see significant price declines for both wind and solar for the next probably decade with known uh, technology that's in the pipeline and expected economies of scale. So here's a more um, a visible comparison of new renewable energy versus the cost of operating existing conventional plants. Uh, and again, just reinforces the point that we are near uh, price parity between new wind and solar uh, and the marginal cost of generating using existing conventional generators. Because of the variability in output from wind and solar, um, what we'll probably see for a while is that they will be built and generate, you know, as they are uh, able to, given wind and, and solar conditions, that will reduce the use of the conventional generators, uh, but they'll sit around to be available at the times when, when wind and solar are not especially available. And then over time, we'll begin to see um, new storage technologies and declining prices of um, batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, fill in those gaps, followed by the closure of those conventional generators. So those are kind of national trends that um, you know will have some effect in the UP. So to look at the opportunities in the UP, I just want to highlight where the resources are and then uh, do a rough calculation. So this graph shows average wind speed uh, at 80 meters. Um, so wind generation of electricity. Um, goes up exponentially with wind speed. Um, so it's a doubling of wind speed is a substantial increase in uh, electricity generation. Uh, the physics are um, a square, but uh, there are some other factors that come in. The um, wind speed increases as you, go, as you go higher above the ground because of friction with the ground. Um, and the amount of friction depends on vegetation and topography and, and things like that. So this map shows the wind speed at 80 meters. Uh, and you be careful, yellow is brighter and wants to jump out. Those are the lower wind speed areas. Uh, the darker brown and sort of orange colors are the high wind speed areas. 
Um, so wind developers are going to want to go where the higher wind speeds are because that's the more profitable place uh, to put wind turbines. Um, as you go to higher hub heights, more places become economical, but there still is a preference for these places. The next couple of graphs show um, the resources that are available at higher hub heights. And I would say that 80 meters is sort of the low end of the market now, and we're typically seeing 90 to 120 uh, meter hub heights, depending on uh, the wind conditions at the site. So at, at 110 meters, you know, you see the same basic pattern, but there are some areas that are uh, more affected um, by that higher hub height. And 140 meters, which is becoming available, uh, the limitation is predominantly how to transport uh, those long blades. Um, you get a little bit of an increment in capacity. So if wind is going to develop further in the UP, I think you can see the kinds of places where it's going to want to go. This map shows solar resources. And while there is some variation, the key point here is there's not a lot of variation. So you can in fact put solar most anywhere in the UP and get roughly the same results. Um, this is just insulation. Um, things like snow and so on can come into the picture that and developers will certainly pay attention to that. Um, but as a practical matter, if solar is feasible in the UP, it's feasible almost everywhere. Hey, Douglas. Yes. Uh, Mike Fransky here. I just saw it as I was, but this this solar resources map, this came from mapping at EIA.gov, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, because this is quite a bit different than one uh, Brett French uh, presented for UPCO it was last year at the UP Energy Summit or what, but it showed, you know, a definite, pre a definite preference for like Menominee, Delta County areas having a, you know, higher potential for solar. Well, they do. And if you look at the colors here, they're muted, but, um, you know, kind of across the southern UP is at a higher rating than across the northern UP. Okay. I'm not saying that there are no differences, just that they're not large. And if it's economically feasible, Anywhere it's probably economically feasible everywhere. Okay. All right, thank you. If you look at biomass resources, um, the biomass resources that uh, are available in the UP, this is sort of annual production rates. Um, th this measures tons per year in the block that's shown. Um, that's just the way that. Uh, EIA does it, um, but I don't think we need to get you know too concerned about it. Probably the key thing about biomass is uh, the economics are such that gathering biomass for the purpose of burning it to generate is just basically not economically feasible. If biomass is being accumulated someplace for other reasons, um, a mill, for example, then uh, it at times is economically feasible, but I think that where we are today is predominantly that what can be done is being done, and it would be very difficult economically to do any new biomass development. So let's just do a rough calculation um, to get a sense of the land areas involved. Um, just as a benchmark, uh, this slide uh, hypothesizes replacing imports, current imports into the UP um, with wind and solar. Um, and that is essentially what um, UPCO's most recent integrated resource plan proposed to do. Um, somewhat arbitrarily, I just did half wind and half solar. That is not far from what would likely happen, but you know, there would be some small differences. Um, so assuming that half of the imported energy was replaced by UP wind and half by 
UP solar can sort of run through the calculations and at the bottom see the land area involved. So solar it would be about two and a half square miles. For wind, the footprint, basically the turbine access road, that sort of thing, would amount to about two tenths of a square mile, but the project area over which the turbines would be spread would be uh, close to 25 square miles. So those are the implications of, you know, doing some significant amount of renewables. Um, presumptively, we wouldn't need to replace the uh, current use of um, hydro. Um, so if we replaced um, cogeneration and a little bit of, you know, direct fossil fuel use uh, there, there, and also the generation within the UP um, with fossil fuels, we'd be looking at two, two and a half times these numbers um, for the UP to be completely self-serving with renewables. So that's just to give you a sense of, you know, what the issues are, how much would need to be accommodated. So to migrate electricity generation to renewables, basically they're already cost effective. We've seen that in UPCO's integrated resource plan where their rates would go down by adopting wind and solar instead of imported power. Um, we've, we've seen it in consumers integrated resource plan and in DTE's integrated resource plan. All of these have been approved by the Public Service Commission. Hey, but Douglas? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I was a little slow on the button here, but uh, that last slide, you showed capacity factor for solar of 0.245. Is that, uh, what solar is that? Is that single axis tracking? Um, yes, with uh, seasonal tilt. Oh, okay. Because uh, up here at Esky, we uh, calculate through NREL at 0.17. So, I mean, that's significantly yeah. higher than what we had estimated, but it is a fixed tilt non-tracking system. So, all right, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you get substantially more by having it move. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and and in the marketplace, for the most part, um, everybody's now installing single oh, access. I'm very sorry for interrupting. <laughs> yes, uh, of course. On the, uh, um, on the tails of the previous um, question. So, but this is, this is sort of, this is not a, um, uh, the capacity factor is not the uh, the number that is adjusted for the albedo effect, that kind of stuff, right? Yes, it is. Oh, it is adjusted. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so uh, where we are is that siting in UP is the challenge. Uh, putting it elsewhere and importing that renewably generated power increases supply risk and reduces local economic benefits. It may not be any easier. Um, larger scale is cheaper, but more disruptive to the landscape. So we really have the question of in whose backyard. Now, let's turn to transportation um, and just say, what if all UP consumption of motor gasoline was replaced with electric vehicles? The annual spending on motor gasoline in the UP is almost 369 million. Dollars, uh, and that translates into a uh, cost of 12 cents a mile for fuel. And then, as a point of reference, annual electricity sales are about uh, 3 million, uh, a little over 3.2 million megawatt hours. If you look at um, electric vehicles, and we've used an average here that includes pickups and so on, um, the, the sort of Tesla sedans are, are more like 0.23 kilowatt hours per mile. We use an, an average of 0.3. And if you use an average electricity rate, a residential rate of 16 cents uh, for the UP, then the average cost per mile for fuel for an electric vehicle is about 5 cents. So. Um, aside from the initial purchase price, um, it is cost competitive today um, on the operating side 
to use an electric vehicle instead of uh, gasoline. Um, if you look at what it would actually cost the UP in increased costs of energy, we would really only have to add generation and uh, transmission costs. And we use that 4.16 cents per kilowatt hour from the earlier slide. So the annual spending on electricity to operate electric vehicles would only be about $39 million. So there'd be about a 90% reduction in energy spending by substituting electricity for gasoline. This of course does not include, you know, the costs of switching uh, from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. The annual electri electricity used to operate those electric vehicles be, you know, about 945,000 megawatt hours, which would be a 29% increase over uh, current sales. So that gives you sort of a picture. Um, to electrify transportation, vehicles have to be available. Um, those are coming. Um, all the major manufacturers have announced multiple 2022 models and are getting into SUVs and pickups and so on. And the projection is that by 2025, the first cost for EVs will be less than for uh, comparable internal combustion engines. Uh, so this could be coming at us fairly quickly. We will need charging infrastructure. Um, generally about 85% of charging is at home. Um, so you can do that in the garage or um, you know, on your property, uh, that's not a problem, but fast charging is needed for road trips. Uh, you can't make a feasible road trip if you have to stop for many hours to charge after going a couple hundred miles. So the current problem with infrastructure is that fast charging has a chicken or egg problem. Um, it's not profitable for someone to install and operate fast charging until there are electric vehicles in use. And it's not viable for people to buy and use electric vehicles without fast charging being available. So that's an area that might deserve our attention. There also is the emerging possibility of electrifying buildings. Um, and I've presented a calculation here for propane. You can do it for other heating fuels and certainly Electrifying natural gas is much harder than electrifying propane on an, on an economic basis. But basically, same kind of calculation here. The annual sp spending on propane in uh, the UP is about $46.5 million. And if we assume an efficiency of about 85%, it, it says furnace, but it's really hot water and cooking as well. Uh, the actual, actual residential heating demand is a little bit over uh, 2 million million BTUs or 2 trillion BTUs. Um, and residential retail cost of propane, uh, this is from 2018, uh, $19.04 a million BTUs. If we assume a modest level of performance from a heat pump, um, it would take half as much electricity to run the heat pump as the heat you get out of it. Then the annual electricity to run heat pumps to replace propane would be about 304,000 megawatt hours. And the at the current, the 16.1 cents um, a kilowatt hour average, that works out to $47.23 a million BTUs. So the retail residential spending on electricity to run heat pumps at the retail rate would be $49 million. Clearly not a good deal for uh, people making that switch. But if you look at the cost to actually generate that, uh, that electricity, which is really the only incremental cost we would have at that um, GNT rate of uh, 4.16 cents, we get to an incremental electricity cost of about $12.6 million, which would be a considerable savings for those propane customers. Um, so as I'm gonna point out kind of on the next slide, the question is how do we get from here to there? 
um, in a way that's feasible. It makes that feasible for people. It's also generally possible to improve building efficiency by about 30% with only cost effective measures. So the lower part of the slide shows what would happen if we made just to the energy expenditures if we made those investments. Uh, the increased electricity sales for that the heat pumps would be about nine and a half percent of current sales. These increases in electricity sales, the way the regulatory process works, would basically dilute the costs of distribution and lower the rates for everyone um, to the extent of that dilution. So if we electrified transportation and propane, we would see something on the neighborhood of a 40% reduction in distribution rates per kilowatt hour. To electrify buildings, um, electrifying heat does increase electricity sales and dilute rates. It significantly reduces the total energy cost for the UP, but the electricity costs more at retail rates than the heating fuel it replaces, making that infeasible for uh, customers to do. The benefits of greater investment in heat pumps would be we could leverage existing incentives and in financing. It would increase demand for skilled trades and provide a workforce there and generate supply chain activity, but it would displace the fossil fueled economy um, in the UP as well. <clears throat> the 30% savings in uh, energy and buildings requires building shell improvements um, like those shown here. That also has economic benefits within the UP um, with the interesting potential benefits, the building shell improvements are primarily forest products and often are somewhat locally produced and that builder, better buildings are healthier for occupants. So the key takeaways I suggest in terms of finding our task force priorities are that we need to explore the comparative cost structures of UP electric utilities. We need to think about renewable energy siting. We need to work on charging infrastructure in order to begin advancing uh, electrification of transportation. To enable building electrification, we need to do some work on electricity rate design. And then to enable deep energy savings in buildings, um, we would need to do some work on financing and workforce and business development in the supply chain. Thank you, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thanks, Doug. Have questions to get started in our discussion. Again, for, uh, questions from task force members, please. Yes, this is Dave Camps. Doug, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, um, that by bringing in EV vehicles, uh, that that would assist the utilities in the UP by increasing their demand. Do you see any partnerships available with the, uh, the utilities to get this, you know, uh, have them help with the uh, conversion to renewable energy to, for the UP? Do you see that going anywhere? Um, that is, in fact, happening in the Lower Peninsula. Um, both DT and consumers with approval of the Public Service Commission have pilot projects that are developing uh, fast charging networks and um, working on integration of home and business charging into the grid. Um, those fast charging uh, projects are being done with a blend of financing by the site host, financing from the Energy Services Office at Eagle, and financing from the utilities, roughly a one third basis. Uh, so yes, I think partnerships are sensible, necessary. Um, we just need to think about how to make it happen. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of utilities about this uh, and they seem like they are really on board with this, that they could be a great resource with this conversion. Yes. But a lot of them yes. are still importing coal from you know uh, other sources on their power purchase. Disagreements. Thank you. Very good presentation, Doug. Thank you. Other questions for Douglas? Hey, this is, this oh, is Mike Larson. Hey, Mike. Is there um, 
in some of those other places with EVs or the utilities that are looking at potentially incentivizing, I'm just thinking about at home, is there any, is there any possibility of utilities developing a rate structure, you know, for home users that, you know, is an EV charging, you know, that is at some rate lower than, you know, current residential rates, you know, as a way to incentivize, you know, essentially their own business because, you know, they'd be creating more demand, you know, that way uh, as well as, you know, as you use the, the use of electricity goes up at home. Part of the pilot project consumers in DTE and indeed at many of the utilities across the country uh, look specifically at that. Um, rather than in some fashion subsidize electricity use, uh, what they've done is to structure rates that are based on time of use and reflect the underlying utility costs. So they charge much more, say, on summer afternoons than at other times. Between 11 p.m. and 5 or 6 a.m., they have very low rates because at those times, utilities have lots of capacity sitting around doing nothing. And people respond very strongly to those signals. So uh, consumers recently reported, you know, how things are going. I don't remember the exact number, but, you know, it's roughly like 90% of the charging occurred between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. when the rates were about, you know, five cents kilowatt hour rather than uh, earlier in the evening when they were around 12 or 13 and certainly not on summer afternoons when they're more like 25. So um, that is a, a way of doing it that serves both the purpose of better integration to the grid uh, and providing a way to charge at low cost. So just to follow up to that, and because right now I don't think we have any utilities in the UP that currently offer a time of use. And so that would be something for the one of, one of your bullet points of thinking about rate structures would be potentially looking at time of use uh, or recommending time of use or something along those lines. It could. Thank you. Yeah, Liesl, I just had a comment there. Um, I agree for the most part with the EV charging and the you know additional heat pump uh, increasing sales would help uh, reduce costs, but it has to be done at the right time. And that and that kind of plays off what Michael Larson just said uh, and and Doug said too with the time of use for cars for home charging of cars. I think that would be pretty easy uh, for fast charging if people are on a trip. I I, I don't know how we're going to um, you know I, I I that may not help. Um, save as much energy we may you know if it gets to the point where it creates enough of a demand where we're you know upgrading lines upgrading transformers um helping drive the annual peak or the monthly peak it's, it's going to increase costs and um I, I would say the same thing with the with the you know the home electrification um you know it's easy enough to charge your car at night but you know people are gonna you know want hot water and and heat and stuff during the day which I believe the UP is still a, a summer peak. Uh, I believe Cloverland was maybe the exception being a winter peak, but um, I, I would just caution that the, these numbers that Doug, a great presentation, but um, I don't know if they're, you know, 100% achievable. So um, just quick response. I certainly intended it as an overview and not a deep dive into each of those issues. Right. Um, because the UP is part of the larger um, MISO uh, market. Um, in terms of transmission distribution, the UP peak matters, but in terms of uh, the power supply, um, if cheap power is available from Wisconsin or Minnesota or Illinois or whatever, Missouri, you know, you can still provide basically cheap power in the UP at those times. So I think the sun, MISO will always be summer peaking and it will always be feasible to provide, or always is a strong word, it will for a long time be feasible to provide low prices in the wintertime. Yeah. Right, Doug. Aaron Johnson, uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, my question is regarding snow. Um, so at MDA, we do utilize uh, solar power in some cases for 
uh, powering flashers and some things, road road signs and devices that need electricity. But generally, I found them to be unreliable with today's technology because the panels get covered with snow and you got to run out there and try to find some way to clean them. So on a larger scale, when you were speaking of solar, you said, you know, if it were economically feasible, you know, it would you know, be viable everywhere in UP. But how big a if is that um, being solar panels would be generally covered up uh, several months of the year? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, in utility scale solar, you can deal with that, right? The, if you have several hundred acres of uh, solar panels, somebody can go out and remove the snow or, or, or you can have ways of temporarily heating them. Other devices are coming. Um, so snow it matters, but is not a killer. Um, I can't, I don't think I can reveal the cost because of um, confidentiality agreements, but you know, I do know from my participation in the regulatory process that UPCO had offers for a solar power purchase agreement that were in the kinds of prices that I was talking about earlier uh, for solar. Uh, so those are not just national prices, those are UP prices. And that would be cheaper than grid power at the times that solar does generate. So it's, you certainly wouldn't get nearly as much solar in the winter as in the summer, but it's still worthwhile even for having the power provided when solar is generating. I would not suggest that we think about trying to depend on solar for 100% of UP power. <laughs> I just like to add there again, this is Mike from Ansky. Uh, Aaron, your questioner, uh, and related to that UPCO uh, proposed facility in uh, Escanaba Township, that was single access tracking, which, you know, they're going to roll over every day. So a lot of the snow is going to fall off. Um, and I'm not sure, but I believe those might have been bifacial panels, which there's um, some evidence showing that when, when you, you know, you get a little glare, and especially after snow, uh, you get more glare in the wintertime than you do in the summertime. It'll heat the back. Uh, is it's generating some power and help melt the snow off the front? My comment for you, uh, Dave Campsher. Yeah, w if you go with black on black panels, uh, they, they clear up on the front and uh, they'll heat the rest of the panel and snow shedding comes off and then your your configuration up here in the northern up is usually uh, it works really well on poles that you can adjust quarterly or or by uh, twice a year and that helps with the snow shedding i don't know about the the uh, albedo hitting the back of the panel how that works but uh, i think uh, solar up here works very well even near the lake with all the lake effect snow we get up here so I think, you know, if you had storage, you know, and a lot of solar up here in the UP, it would be, it would work. You know, I think you could run things on renewables up here pretty, pretty uh, easily, even in the northern UP, from the performance of the systems we've installed. So, to me, the important take Douglas's presentation is the interconnectedness of how uh, a future grid um will need to operate so you know it's you know certainly we can have these discussions about uh nuances around solar and how solar is adapting and changing you know the same kind same thing can be true for wind for battery storage um for you know if we see more on the demand side with electrification of um, transportation electrification of buildings um i think um what douglas laid out helps us see how um it's way more interconnected. You also, you know, another key component that um, is an important uh, uh, com important piece of what this grid looks like going forward is um, kind of that internet of things and making sure that we've got the um, communications that are necessary in order to allow that back and forth flow uh, for a more connected grid too. You know, so there's a lot of pieces here um, that it's just a little different than what we've done in the past. So just to contrast it with Aaron's presentation, which was excellent, but you look at the um, 
hydro facility that you know is a chunk of megawatts and was built 92 years ago. Um, it's just very different, a big hydro facility like that compared to you know what a grid of the future might look like um, taking different pieces from um, uh, Douglas's presentation. So um, I hope that it's gotten everybody thinking. Um, I know we've got some questions here. We, we've got time for a couple more and we're losing members. I'm getting emails and texts from folks that people had 12 o'clock commitments. Uh, so I don't want to go necessarily too far with additional discussion. So if we've got uh, clarification questions for Douglas now, I think that'd be great. And then um, I'd like to move to public comment and um, use this to set up our next discussion together. So other other questions for Douglas before we go to public comment? Um, this is Jen Hill. Um, the first one on the exploring the comparative cost structures, just to, sort of as a process point for the task force, um, that seems like less of a technical, it's like we've just been having a technical conversation and more of a, I don't know if that's strictly a regulatory conversation or what, what could you maybe elaborate on that a little more? Um, I meant in, in this way, um, we see very different rates um, across the utilities. Some of that is differences in the allocation to classes, but some of it is clearly just a difference in the relative cost of providing the service. Um, and the reputation of the UP for high prices reflects those parts of the UP that have high prices, um, but it's clearly not necessary to have high prices uh, in the UP. There must be reasons. And so understanding those and making recommendations seems to me central to our charge to look at the affordability of energy in the UP but I did not mean to prescribe a particular way of analysis. Douglas, why don't you flip back to slide 34 just so everybody can have the context of that bullet, if you don't mind. Let's see. I think it was just one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Almost there. There, perfect. This okay. one. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sorry, misunderstood where you wanted me to go. No, no. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yes, I have one. This is Dave Camps, and this is for Director Clark. Um, what's the priorities? For Michigan, uh, how, are we behind on EV infrastructure? Is that in a cri not a crisis situation, but is that getting to be more urgent? And the propane line, the propane situation looks like uh, that's getting a little uh, energized here and, and critical. I mean, if we were going to start an effort in the UP trying to approach these along with, you know, there's a bunch of suggestions here that Doug did, uh, gave us, but would it serve us better to go after these critical uh, infrastructure issues that we're developing, such as the propane line, go after propane customers uh, uh, first, and there's a number of things we could suggest to do that and then get uh, uh, the EV infrastructure in uh, for the DC fast charging on the corridors in any way. Something like that, I was thinking more of a, of a of approach that might be a, a little bit of a trigger to tip over the rest of the uh, building uh, electrification and stuff like that, you know, might be weapon phone, propane customers and uh, EV vehicles to start and uh, see what that does. Yeah, I mean, those are great points, Dave. I think, first off, from a prioritization perspective, I mean, that's up to this group, right? So that's why we're trying to get these presentations in front of this group um, to make decisions about what uh, we want to prioritize in recommendations to the governor. You know, to Douglas's point from the outset, you know, we're now six months away from um, finalizing the second um, chunk of our work. Uh, and so we need to decide as a team, you know, what is it that we want to prioritize? Uh, EV infrastructure um, is a challenge. Um, I think that there continues to be work done there. Um, I know that Chairman Scripps had to get off, but with the combined utility investment in Michigan, Michigan has um, 
the most utility EV infrastructure investment in the Midwest. Now, um, as has been correctly pointed out a few times, that looks different in the UP in particular. So I think that uh, as we're continuing to see the increase in auto shares uh, for vehicle electrification, it's still, um, you know, to Douglas's point from earlier, it's still lagging. I think we're at 3% uh, EV purchase last year overall compared to, I think it's 9% globally. And as I mentioned earlier, Norway's at 50%. Now there's policy reasons they're at 50%, but I think it's important to compare as we think about uh, technical feasibility too, because if they've figured out how to get the infrastructure and batteries to work um, at their um, latitude, I think you know we can tackle that same problem um, with some learning from other places. So you know we want to shamelessly appropriate what's gone well in other places, uh, but certainly EV infrastructure <laughs> would be a place for you know this group to spend time if we decide that that's our prioritization. So um, I think it's a good time to digest uh, the presentation from Douglas, which was comprehensive and touched on a lot of different areas um, that would make up kind of a um, a web to weave together if we're thinking about what does a future UP infrastructure look like. And so I appreciate what Douglas laid out here so that it can get us kind of ruminating on that. And um, I am also uh, looking forward to all of you providing suggestions about, you know, what additional types of conversations you want to hear. Obviously, um, the team at Eagle has a lot of ideas about what is important to put in front of you to help uh, help us uh, get to recommendations at the end of the year. But I want to know um, what you all are interested in hearing too. And so I've gotten a couple of emails while we've been here. Um, discussing future potential topic areas. Okay. Other questions? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, uh, the other thing you had, uh, I was reading this yesterday, so I really appreciate the uh, detail put in, effort put into this presentation by Doug. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, uh, exactly. But, uh, Thank you. The, fuel the fuel switching I have is a little bit of an uh, issue, you know, from a business standpoint. When we go out and try to electrify a building or something like that, we run into a little bit of fuel, switch uh, fuel switching issues uh, from Efficiency United and stuff like that. Uh, that may have to be considered if we're going to electrify the UP at some point. And choice legislation, I don't know. Uh, I know that's a, a really reduced cost. We have a customer up here that's getting really reduced cost. It seems a little, I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of this choice legislation, but I don't know if it's going to be a roadblock for electrification or anything. Choice may is have. Okay. That's one we're going to table for later, but I agree with you, Dave. It came up to mind for me a couple of times when Douglas was talking. Not just choice, but the regulatory structure overall. Okay, and then one other comment I have, like at Michigan Saves, we work with them a lot. Sometimes the utilities go in and they'll do buy downs on them and, and the interest rate goes to zero. That's a common method of, on, on getting pilot programs implemented for um, whatever efficiency um, measures they're trying to do, but that could run across the board to uh, renewable energy too, if that were, you know, if we got EU into uh, a, a solar programs. You know, because I've talked to a number of people there recently that uh, know what Superior Watership Partnership is doing on, on solar, and they sort of would like to do the same thing. But, you know, it, it, they're a big organization that would be pretty effective. They've been pretty effective at efficiency measures, but they'd probably be good at solar, too. Might be might be uh, worth a look. Yeah, and in fact, you should see if you can do um, uh, renewables right now, but you're right. It'd be nice to be able to see if we can use some of those more creative programs um, to buy down costs. Okay, That's other right. overall questions? I think um, I'm going to keep us moving into public comment. Anybody got anything else they'd like to make sure they get on the table? OK, well, thanks again, Douglas. Thanks again, Aaron. Great presentations. And I think uh, certainly for me, a lot of thinking this morning. So hopefully for others as well. Yep. Thanks to all of you for listening. <laughs> thanks, Doug and Aaron. Great, so we're going to go to public comment. And I see that we have uh, one hand raised from the public. And then Kimber, just let me know if you have anything else that comes in through email or in any other way. Um, so. I think this is Mr. Horst, who's been with us before. Mr. Horst, if you would like to go ahead and take yourself off mute and introduce yourself and say where you're from, and then we'd love to hear from you for three minutes. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. It's uh, Horst Schmidt, and uh, I'm uh, from Houghton, and I'm also uh, with the Upper Peninsula Environmental Coalition. Uh, one thing that struck me when um, the talk was about the Cloverland um, of, um, area that they served, and and knowing that their rate is uh, substantially lower than Upco's, and Upco's claim was that they always had higher rates because they had to run through so much territory where they weren't generating revenue. Is is that similar to what is what uh, Cloverland faces in terms of of covering a lot of territory, but yet having much lower overall rates uh, as than uh, Upco? Um, so, sorry, we're not answering questions. I think that you're hitting on something that um, is a reason that the task force members were also interested in hearing from UFCO and Cloverland, so. But uh, the thing is, it wasn't, it's something that uh, I would think we would want to have addressed is that is the um, the task force going to be addressing that issue in the future, the differential between a co-op and a uh, for-profit uh, organization. So I'm sorry, Mr. Schmidt, we're not, this, this is not an opportunity for the task force to answer questions from the public. We're very happy to hear what you're thinking about, and this is going to help the task force members also think and um, ask for different presentations going forward. Okay, well, then I guess that, that will end what I have to say. Thank you. Yep, thanks for sharing. Do we have other members of the, uh, yes, I do see, oh, no. Do I see other members of the public that are interested in giving public comment? You can either raise your hand um, or if you want to take yourself off mute and let us know. All right, one more quest, question. Any members of the public who want to give public comment today to the UP Energy Task Force? Give everybody a second to get off mute if they need to. Hi, my name is Sharon. I'm from Newberry. Can you hear me? Hi, Sharon. Yep, you sound great. You got three minutes. Okay, well, I don't actually need all three <laughs> minutes. I left a statement in the meeting chat, okay. and I wonder if that qualifies as public comment, or do I need to go over it here? Nope, you're good. You can go over it here if you'd like to. Otherwise, we'll pull it out and include it in the official um, recording. I was just concerned that the village of Newberry Water and Light um, no longer purchases power through um, Cloverland, and yet we're included in all their maps and stuff, and our data was not broken out individually, and I think it should be. Okay. Thanks for making that point, Sharon. You bet. Okay. All right. Anybody else interested in giving public comment today? All right, with that, um, I'm going to remind us when our next meeting is, which is in my notes here. October 7th is our next meeting. Uh, so that's the first Wednesday of October. So um, we'll work, look for an agenda a little bit before as well as meeting minutes. Oh, I do have one hand go up. All right, Linda Rulison, you caught me. Good job, Saved by the Bell. You got. Um, three minutes. Go ahead if you want to take yourself off mute, Linda. We'll see if we can hear you. I just did. You can hear Great. me. Great. Yep, you sound good. So, Linda, if you can introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, and then you have three minutes. Uh, Linda Rulison from Houghton County, um, Friends of the Land of Key Rena, But I just wanted to thank the task force to making this um, available to us. I was glad to hear the task force goals outlined and the discussion around it. I thought it was very informative. So I just wanted to thank you all for that opportunity. Oh, thanks, Linda. All right. We like that kind of public comment. <laughs> like all public comment, but. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, any, um, let me ask again, anybody else want to give public comment? Okay, so we'll meet again on Wednesday, October 7th. Look for meeting notes, meeting minutes and agenda. Um, before that day, again, um, for those of you who are not task force members who are following along, there's material at michigan.gov slash UP Energy Task Force. You can see previous presentations 
um, previous recorded recordings, uh, previous minutes, all that kind of stuff. So um, thanks everybody for your time. Um, it's nice to see your faces. I didn't know how much I missed everybody when we didn't get together for three days. So um, appreciate it. Reach out and um, we'll all talk soon. Have a good Thank one. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.